Hello and welcome to Pookie Ponders, the podcast where I explore big questions with brilliant people. Today I'm in conversation with Val Bolan and our question is, how does Western education impact on the mental health of our young people? Could it be time for change? Okay, um, my name is Val Bolan. I am a specialist uh, teaching assistant. I work in um, a special needs high school um with students with challenging behaviors and on the autistic spectrum i love my job love my job um i work with a fantastic team my background however was in my training was in social care yeah. so that's where i came from but my interest was was always towards um special needs always um and and, and i even at college, that was the module I loved. It was the placement I loved the most. So I kind of knew really that it was going to go in that direction at some point. Um, after taking a step out, career, blah, 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 having children, getting married, doing all that malarkey, um, I uh, went back to work and that was when I hit education. So that was about, I don't know, 11 or 12 years ago, something like that. And, um, and I went straight into working with children on the SEN register in a mainstream high school so I've supported in mainstream I've supported in special schools and I've supported right the way through from uh, nursery age right through to um, sixth form and recently I had a few months working in a college which was a whole other ball game when it was just as interesting it was really good um, I am intensely passionate about the students that I work with and that they are understood. That's that's my that's my that's my main thing. And I had the privilege of working when I very first went into education with a fantastic Senko and she gave me the most amazing advice as a teaching assistant. She just said you're neither teacher nor friend, you're the middle road and you're a bit of both and you know you're reflecting both sides to each other in mainstream absolutely in special school setting it's slightly different um you are more you're just staff simple as um and i love it i just love it so yes so i i you know here i am talking to you <laughs> and thank you and and actually i think um you know i i, I can't not uh, say thank you to you for the input that you've had over the last few months and and uh, you've you've come to uh, more than one of our courses and uh, taking the stage when i've handed the mic over and really helped people with really practical ideas about how we can support children at this sort of really challenging juncture and i, I love your practical approach and how down to earth it is and so many people have benefited from the uh, the ideas and resources that you've put together I'm really pleased. Um, so thank you so but today we come with a really big and deep and gnarly question um so the question of the episode was how does western education impact on the mental health of our young people and could it be time for a change so why this question what what why did this kind of come up for, for you this was you that, that put this question forward it was me and me and my big mouth um i am um, was uh, i was i was doing a course online during lockdown um about mental health awareness with young people and young adults and it was it was a question that was posed as one of the modules it was an assignment that was that was to to be done so it was to watch these two small video clips and answer this question based on what thoughts had been provoked from watching the videos and it just it, it woke up a whole thing in me that I think has been dormant for some time um, you know, big questions, it's all well and good having big questions, but, you know, how on earth do we make big changes? And that's a, that's a challenge. And I think over the years, you kind of, you put those things aside, you think, right, okay, this is my bit, I can do my bit. Um, but it sort of all came tumbling out, to be honest, and it all came out in an essay. And then I just thought, I want to do something with this, but I don't know where to start. Um, <clears throat> And as I got to know you a little bit, um, I thought you might be able to give me an idea as to where I could maybe discuss this or send it. And um, 
here we are discussing it <laughs> yeah indeed and and tell me i mean what so what was your your kind of take on this because obviously you've worked with um you know children and young people who perhaps have been more impacted hence they've ended up sort of working with yourself and on the sen register or with with kind of known mental health issues mm -hmm. so i'm guessing you're gonna say yes it has an impact but yeah you know don't let me put words in your mouth let me know what what, what did you say in your essay I am, um, I, I basically, the, the two videos are fascinating, by the way, and that absolutely, I think they're a really good watch. Um, and they, they both look at it slightly differently. The first one is called Playing the Game of Life. And it's a, it's a talk that was given by a guy called Alan Watts, who's a British philosopher. And the video has been put to his talk later. And it, it, it kind of rolls into the question of we're always looking for the next thing and our education system and the way that we that, that we train our children and we raise our children and even into adulthood we're always looking for the next thing so every step that we take is just preparation for what's next so we never get that feeling of getting there we never kind of feel like we achieve anything in lots of ways mm -hmm. and i think that can be incredibly damaging yeah. to to young people to young children in particular and i think when that rot sets in early on which i think it does in more children than i think we would like to admit if i'm honest um then i think when that sets in young you've, you're at the thin end of the wedge then and then you know you're dealing with self-esteem issues you're dealing with with ideas of of not being able to achieve of of never feeling like it's worth it because you're never going to get there um and i see a lot of that with um in in the older children of the older students that i've worked with where they're completely disaffected what's the point what's the point you know what what what's the point in this what's the point in that um so he was he was very much looking at it from that point of view the second one was 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 really Ah, mind blowing um and that was uh, by a guy called sir ken robinson and he's a, an education and creativity expert and again it was a it, it was a video that was put to a talk that he had done some years ago but the way that they did it was done by the rsa the world society for encouragement of arts and whatever and they there was a guy he, he kind of he illustrates the talk as it's being given and it's fabulous it's i'm very visual I'm, I'm you know i like to see things so for me it was it was fabulously thought-provoking and he came at this from the idea of that that our education system our current education system was kind of founded um during the the time of of, of what's known as i've come to understand as the time of enlightenment and the industrial revolution and it it was it was necessary at the time and it was founded on the whole factory system so even the way that we run our school day so we go in and then there's a bell for break and then we all go off for break and we have our little break and then we come back and we carry on working again um and he also challenges the idea that <clears throat> how we group children together um why do we group them by age why don't we group them by ability why don't we group them by need why don't we group them by you know preference of learning style why why do we particularly think that every child is going to be at the same stage of development following their just their you know their age so it it, it threw up so many questions for me and i think for me in this current climate with um the whole COVID situation that we're in we have an opportunity to really stand back and examine what we do um and also the essay kind of took me in the direction of thinking about how we value or don't value various terms of various forms of intelligence okay. so we look at um intellectual academic intelligence and that our whole school system is about academic intelligence and there are so many other forms of intelligence and 
I kind of wrote a little story in the essay about, you know, a guy who, um, and I've seen this in school myself, especially in mainstream, I have seen this, where, you know, you've got your students who are um, studying BTEC, they're following a BTEC yeah. uh, format of learning. And then you've got your GCSE students, they are following that. The subject matter is the same. The outcomes are the same. The learning's the same. How it's taught is different. How it's recorded is different. How it's assimilated is different. How it's assessed is different. But the knowledge is the same. And yet we don't see photographs on the front of a newspaper of our BTEC students jumping up and down when they get their certificates. And I'm not by any means um, you know, minimising the importance of academic intelligence. I think there is, you know, it, all forms of intelligence, in my opinion, should be celebrated. And I think where I've seen this polarisation in schools, there's often um, a superior kind of um, air around your GCSE student cohort. And it's almost like, oh, they are just the BTEC students, you know. And it, it's that attitude. So this little story that I kind of told was was about somebody who was a GCSE high flyer and went on eventually to become a professor of, I don't know, mathematics or science or something. I can't remember the example I gave now, but something like that. And um, but he absolutely loved the theatre and he you know, was often the first on his feet to applaud and yeah, 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 bravo, bravo. And because he was a professor, he would he would move in circles where he could meet some of the some of the thespians that he would go to see. And this particular night, he went to see performance and loved this performance. It was in his hometown. It was a touring company. He met the lead guy, and the lead guy went, "Oh, well, nice to meet you." Blah blah blah. You don't remember me, do you? Um, and they went to school together and. He was a BTEC student who then went on to be somebody who was he was quite starstruck by. And I, I, I think for me, I, I know that's very um, it's very sweeping, and it, it, you know, it's 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 very cliche. But I've seen that. I've seen yeah. that attitude in school. And sadly, not just from students, sadly, I've seen that from staff, too. And I think we're setting up our young people to be disappointed to be disaffected and to undermine themselves at every turn if you're not an academic achiever sorry that was a rather long-winded answer to your question it was quite a long answer <laughs> I do apologize <laughs> no don't apologize i i found it very it, it, very thought-provoking actually and i wonder what do you think we could and should be doing differently because as you said tonight reflecting on this moment that we're in right now um it is a moment when for the first time in living memory my living memory certainly that that exams have been cancelled or um you know things have happened differently temporarily but you're suggesting that maybe this is the moment for a bit of a reset what should it look like instead um in an ideal world I think we should go right back to the drawing board. I think it is, um, I think we could easily say, no, it's too big, it's too challenging, it's too hard. But when I think about, you know, those guys back in the, you know, the Industrial Revolution, they, there was no education system at all. And they put it together. And it was a massive challenge. And I'm sure that they were told, this is not a good idea, this is not going to work. Um, and I also think that there are a million and one different ways that we could approach it. I think, interestingly enough, I was talking to my uh, niece recently who is, is in, lives in Germany and her boys go to a school there where they are set by um, their ability. They're not, they're not set by just their age and they have year groups mixed together. Um, I think we could learn a lot from that system. Scandinavian systems, I think, you know there's a lot to be learned from other approaches around the world and I, I think just because it's always been done this way doesn't mean it has to always be done this way um yeah it's going to be challenging yeah it's going to be expensive mm -hmm. it's going to be difficult mm -hmm. but does that mean we shouldn't give it a go mm -hmm. i think we should 
And do you think there are, you know, for, for some students or in some circumstances, benefits to how things are happening now? Because it feels that we're moving, obviously, the pandemic aside, yes. um, that we're moving more in the opposite direction than what you're saying, like, you know, the introduction of the phonics testing, for example. Um, and certainly I saw something shared on Twitter yesterday that wasn't from the UK, but from Australia. I think it was Southern Australia talking about how massively um, the... Um, ability of children to read had increased in the years since they'd introduced that phonics testing I just kind of wondered what your sort of take on that is that a positive thing I found myself wondering or have they just got better at passing the test I, I don't I don't know I didn't really delve into it but mm. Mm. I think that um having been involved in in delivering a couple of different phonics programs over the years I think there's great value to a phonics program um I think you know there are a number of good ones out there a number of good models out there that are all based on the same idea and i think there is benefit to those things i think that's much more beneficial than a lot of the models that we've had in the past and certainly more beneficial than rote learning and just copying um my only question is do we bring this in a little early in this country Again, harken back to Scandinavia, you know, I understand that there were some studies done there and I, I can't cite them because it was years ago when I read them, but the idea being there that, you know, they begin formal education much later than we do in this country. And yet by the time our children are about nine years of age, it's much of a muchness in terms of development. There isn't, so I, I question, is there, is there validity in starting it so early? Are we, you know, there's there's a whole question around testing generally, but I think phonics as an approach is absolutely spot on. I think it's a great way to go. And again, you can't remove academic learning and understanding. And I, I, I wouldn't want to, you know, at all. I think to undervalue that is just as damaging as undervaluing everything else. But I think we've just we're out of balance I think we're out of kilter and there's more to celebrate than than that and talk to me about that idea around the the, the starting age so I know that's something that you specifically have got kind of fairly strong views on about what mm. age maybe children should be starting because you've worked um as you said in your introduction with children right across the the kind of age range um including the tinies and mm. I, I wonder what you know do you, if not formal education are there other things that you feel would be helpful at that age or what what are the things that you know as as, as parents and as educators um we should be wanting for our children and what age I think if we're looking at formal education, I'll stick my neck out and say maybe we shouldn't be going there until they're about six, mm -hmm. if I'm honest. Um, just on what I've read and on what I've seen, I think for in terms of emotional development and, again, looking at this from a mental health point of view, in terms of stability and, and, uh, um, and resilience and all of those things, I think we remove our children, I think, a little too soon from the home environment. I would like to see a lot more support out there for um, parents, whoever they may be, to be able to stay at home if they want to and support their kids. You know, it, 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 one of the things I struggled with when, when my mum little was, you know, as, as a low income family, as we were at the time, it was, it, it was very difficult. Now I was going to be supported to go to work. My childcare would be paid for. And yet I wanted to stay at home with my children. I wanted to be there with them in, in those formative years. And I think in terms of attachment, and I, I've worked with a number of, uh, of young people with attachment disorders and, you know, it all starts there. And if we can, if we can preserve that nurturing kind of place for as long as possible, I think we're on to a winner for the future. Um, in terms of provision, before that, it needs to be play-based, as far as I'm concerned. Absolutely, again, the Scandinavian model is phenomenal, as, as far as I see it, as far as I understand it. I think it's a wonderful model. Um, and and they, they create the environment for children to learn and explore. Uh, yeah, and I think, I think that's one of the things that we sometimes forget that 
playing is a really important way of learning, isn't it? And um, I had um, Greg Bottrell on the podcast a few weeks ago, who's a play expert, which I'm a bit jealous of, to be honest, mm. what job. <laughs> um, but he was talking to me about, um, you know, how as adults we can let go a bit and actually learn to play and be more playful in our approach um, and how children of all ages can really learn a lot. And he was talking to me because in the current context where many children and families and educators are quite anxious about how much learning time has been lost and how do we rebuild um you know make up for lost time and, and rebuild those connections and all those kind of things and he was really advocating for this very playful approach right across the ages and yeah i wondered how that kind of marries up with your your thoughts so saying it should be play-based that doesn't necessarily mean learning's not happening does it no absolutely not in fact i think quite the opposite i think i think in that environment i think more learning takes place because if we if we create an environment where where our children are relaxed and they're they're comfortable and they feel safe and they feel understood and they feel nurtured um and it's a warm welcoming environment um to pinch one of your phrases then i think you know that that enables learning that enables learning and um and i think that's i think that's the same right way through but i think particularly for our for our very young children at the moment returning to school is is can be traumatic for a lot of them some of them not so much and that's great that's fantastic but i think we need to be mindful of those who are finding it difficult yeah. definitely and just playing devil's advocate a little bit you said some of the children that you've worked with um who are on the sen register have had um attachment disorder um, and i'd just be interested to to pick that apart a little bit because um you know arguably it might be that for some of those children they are coming to school too soon and they're not ready and that causes that that difficulty and that separation anxiety but for some of those children it might be that those difficulties are there because there's challenge in the home and that for them actually being in a safe environment at school yes. might be really important yeah oh absolutely and i think this is where this is where we need to be more mm, i don't know perhaps fluid in our approach and 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 i think school has moved towards being more nurturing over over the last few years for sure um and and i know that that's resisted sometimes but i actually think if we can if we can further nurture then where we have children who are in difficult home circumstances and the multidisciplinary approach of you know other agencies involved then if we can if we can up the ante of that um you know having some specialists maybe set in school you know some you know some some camps workers some school counselors and all of these things within the school environment then i think we can aid our children to move forward um and also you know just the understanding of how it all works and for me a, a big green light was um was the whole idea of but when we come to adolescence when our children come to adolescence how we've got an opportunity there you know the whole neurological process breaks down and new neural pathways formed and we have a wonderful opportunity there to to reinforce and to create new memories to create new ways of understanding and i think if we can if we can marry those two things together and if we can understand those things a little bit more no matter if we're teaching maths, science, art, drama, it doesn't matter what we're doing. If we can have that understanding, then I think we're in a place where we can take that opportunity and we can help our young people with attachment disorder. What does that look like in practice? I think it needs to be massively personalised. Um, and one of the schools I worked in there's a lady who works there and she is she, she's called a learning mentor in in that particular school um and she she does some work with parents and families and, and and carers and such like but a lot of what she does is on the nurture side with her students and i think where there are opportunities for for children to be able to have anchor points in the day to have those points where they know there's a safe person and a safe place that they can connect to i think that's vital special schools do it well some mainstream schools 
do it well. Some mainstream schools try really hard to do it well, but are under resourced for whatever reason. And some mainstream schools don't seem to have it in their thinking. And I think I'm not saying that that's you know anybody's fault. It's just the way that things have evolved, and I, I think it's an awareness that it would I would love to see those pockets of safety in every school in the country without a shadow of a doubt that's what i would love to see and, and that's i think part of the challenge isn't it is is that it's difficult when looking at a system that maybe doesn't quite feel like what we would want optimally and being able to envisage you know this utopian vision of what education might look like but we have to be realistic about what we can meaningfully change um and so what do you think we can do kind of each of us every day i mean you're um someone who's worked right on the front line as a, a teaching assistant supporting children for many years and i think that um staff like yourself um i work with people like you all the time and i think you often don't um like there's often a lack of confidence there or feeling like i ju i'm just a teaching assistant i i hear that a lot and actually i think that for many children and and particularly the kind that we're thinking about today who find the education system isn't quite meeting their needs you're the most important people of all but what do you think what what can you do that makes a difference there if we can't change the system how can we change it for for a particular child and make it a bit more manageable I, I think I think you're right. I think the role the role of the TA is um, is is key in lots of ways. I, I, I think we you know we can we can see things around the room that the teachers maybe obviously because they have to concentrate on what they're delivering don't see. And I think from a relationship point of view, which is absolutely fundamental. Um, and, and, and key in terms of helping and supporting any child that's struggling or any child at all, that place of creating a place of safety. And I think we need to be, just be more flexible in our approach. And I think that we need to be able to have timeouts. I think we need to be able to have those, not, not only for the students on the SEN register either. I think that that's, I think it's something that nurturing support I think is something that most students would benefit from in one form or another. It may not always be one-to-one, -one. it can be small group, it can be all sorts of things. It doesn't necessarily have to go for the whole year either. We can do things for a season, we can do things for a term. And, and I, I think I would like to see space on the timetable for those things to happen. Um, and I would like to see, um, staff who who have got a a desire and a and a a passion for that to be released to be able to do it um and where there are natural relationships let's encourage those tutor time you know in the morning in mainstream school tutor time can be really important and yet it's it's amazing to me how much we want to pack into that you know, i've worked in schools where they pack in extra extra reading extra spellings extra maths extra this extra that you know okay when when do these guys get to just be who they are with each other with the adults because they can do that in the playground but not so much with the adults in the school and i think that's possibly somewhere we could start possibly something we could look at so what would you imagine um a, a tutor time might look like um, if not doing maths or spelling or catching up on notices or squeezing in uh, PSHE if it's not otherwise timetabled what, what would you imagine it looking like in an ideal I think the, the things that I, the, the times that I've seen it work well is schools where I've, I've looked at and they they take it as a time to just to just chill together and it would give an opportunity for a teaching assistant working with that class to take one or two of them out go and do something one-to-one -one, go and do something in a small group go and you know and sometimes it's as simple as going to a quiet room and making a hot chocolate and having a biscuit together and just having a chat yeah. and it's incredible the things that come out during that time and you begin to understand why you know 
why Bob always kicks off on maths lesson three on a Thursday because you know in the morning on Thursday this always happens in his house or you know things change or he's you know he's, he's been to this parents or that parents or he's stayed with grandparents or there's all sorts of things that can come out in those conversations and I think we need to I don't think actually we need to create the space I think we just need to acknowledge where the spaces are that we could use already in our timetable. So it sounds a little bit like you're saying that rather than kind of cramming full every moment, it's about almost allowing a bit of a time to, to kind of breathe and, and reflect and uh, just slow the pace down a little bit and just be. Absolutely. And how can we do that when there's so many pressures on the school day? Because I guess presumably the reason why spellings, maths, whatever is being squeezed in there is just because there literally aren't enough hours in the day. Um, and particularly like now when so much time has been lost. There has been time lost, I do agree. There has been time lost. I I just question what's more important. Um, I think our learning can be caught. It, it can be caught up. Okay, if we, let's say we all miss a year. Hmm. Will the sky fall? No. If we have our GCSEs a year later than perhaps we would have done normally, will the world come to an end? No. But if we cram everything and make this more pressured already, then are we setting ourselves up for even further mental health issues down the road? And I think we are, if we don't just take a breath and use some of those times in the day when we can allow our young people to do that. I've been wondering about this quite a bit lately. Um with the kind of you know ongoing situation with the pandemic and how there's just this general feeling of anxiety wherever you go completely understandably um it's an objectively difficult time right now um but all that we know about kind of um co-regulation and our lower arousal approach and supporting you know often i'm thinking about how we'd support kids on the autistic spectrum in particular mm. by keeping ourselves really calm and regulated and i've been wondering about how that applies in the wider setting at the moment because i feel like everyone you know there's this like kind of bubbling anxiety all the time and uh, yes yeah, so i've been turning my mind a little bit to thinking about your idea around sort of tutor time and maybe those transitions from breaks and lunch and how taking a few minutes there actually just to kind of get to a place of calm um and and collected thought together might mean actually that we get more learning done rather than less I think um, so. i'm not sure what your kind of thought on that is or how that might be working in your current setting um is better at that often in special schools no yeah i think so i i think i think generally the the approach for the autistic spectrum student is kind of i think that would be a beneficial benchmark across the board yeah. i remember again i worked with a, a wonderful lady who was who she, she just mentored me so much in in the first few years that i worked in education and and she kind of took this approach in terms of dyslexia. So she would speak to when she delivered training on, on um, how to help the dyslexic student in your classroom. She would say, if you pitch your lesson at the dyslexic student's needs, you will catch everybody else as well. And I actually think it's the same with autistic spectrum. And I think if we, if we can take all of those approaches that work really, really well, with, with our, our students on the spectrum and apply those across the board, especially right now, mm. we will see that whole thing begin to ease up. And I think we will see engagement in learning, we will see engagement in understanding, we will see increased um, thirst for knowledge because there'll be that sense of which your brains just, their brains have just had a chance to have a rest just let them have five minutes let them collect themselves and then give them space to re-engage and it, it works it, it and, works and what would that look like in practice so you know what would be the you know maybe three or four things that are how we modify our practice to support um our autistic learners that are actually things you think we could be doing all the time i think the whole um the whole swan approach that you talked about in, in, in the course that you did, I think that it, it has to be, we have to look at those things as being the most important things that we do at the beginning of every day and after lunch. 
I think those things we need to be looking at activities or non-activities that we do that will create that kind of environment you know it's safe it's welcoming it's the sense of being all together it's nurturing and I think that's really really vital if we can do that at those two key times in the day if we can say to our young people at those two key times you are important who you are is important not just the fact that we want you to tick our data boxes by passing all these tests so that we can look like a really good school that but actually you are important who you are is important i want to be able to listen to you i think the whole art of listening to our students is is something that we need to give more time to and listening to what they say but listen to what they don't say you know i was in a minibus full of kids today and it was fascinating i love to just sit there and listen to them talk to each other and fall out with each other and bicker with each other and argue with each other and and try and patch things up and you say all sorts of things you, you know the, the the repeated things that they say and it gives you an insight that talking to them never will do listening to them and we need to have those times to listen and i wonder as well if um you know education moves a bit more that way where we're really taking that more sort of child-centered slightly slower um approach that that might not be a more appealing prospect actually for people entering the profession because we do have a big issue with with burnout and churn and yeah the retention is not good right now um no massive massive and i also think you know it's it, it's a and and then again you know is that a reflection of of the state of the mental health of the nature, nation as well mm. of, you know that you've got people who who have studied really hard and wanted to go into teaching and done a year done a couple of years and thought can't do this I, i'm out and who can blame them you know mm. I, it, the pressure's massive um and i think that could be a reflection of some of those things as well and where we've got people cracking right left and center where we've got children cracking right left and center where we've got staff cracking right left and center where we like you say we're having a take-up that is lower than i think it's ever been mm. um we need to ask these questions why why that's you know why are these things happening and how can we readjust our approach to to welcome our students to welcome people like you say in the profession at, at all levels you know support level teaching level I, you know so many wonderful people out there who would be great assets in school and you know but it's yeah that's it it's a really challenging um profession to yeah. to to enter really you know and that's it and i you know take my hat off to to people like yourself who work every day in school but it's it's really tough and i think particularly actually at this particular moment in time so um this will go out in a few weeks time but we're recording this on the eve of lockdown two in uh, the uk um and this will mean that basically no one's going anywhere except schools are still open <laughs> and so you will still be going to school every day and um, obviously there are other key workers who are still working as well but I think it's a really important thing to note really is actually that those people who are working in schools are essentially putting themselves in you know at risk in order to support the needs of our children and young people and I think you know there's there's so much there to be grateful for and that's really important because our children are struggling right now and they need that they get so much from school um, but it, you know, I don't know, it's a lot to expect really, isn't it? I think, you know, if you sign up as a, for a job as a paramedic, maybe you expect to put yourself in the, in the face of challenge, adversity, danger, but maybe when you, you know, said you were going to be a teaching assistant, you didn't expect to have to make these kind of choices. Not so much, <laughs> not so much. <laughs> but um, I think there are ways around it. Um, you know, I think we can, I think we can do this. I think there are, definitely other approaches again that we could take that would maybe further minimize the risk um you know rotations of uh, you know students in one week not the next um you know di distance learning and and all of that like we're seeing with the universities are a lot of them are taking that approach 
And I, I think there are a lot of things that we can do to minimise um, the risk. It's just a tricky one, isn't it? Because you're looking at the needs of young and vulnerable people. And when I look at our high school students and you know the rate of infection increasing among high school students and in particular I think you know the challenge there to be as safe as possible in a special school setting that's a little more challenging again because you know there is physical contact is very important yeah um you can't you can't avoid it it's just not going to happen well for some children their entire curriculum is sensory isn't it depending on, on what their needs are and uh, exactly. yeah that's hard if you can't touch <laughs> absolutely, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. how are you feeling about it personally a little torn um i i think on the one hand i especially a number especially a lot of young people that i know not just in in the school that i'm in but in others as well where, like you were saying before, school is actually the safe place for them. School is the place that regulates their life. Um, I think for them, it's vital that they have access to, to that, to the physical building. I think that we could easily create safer ways of doing things. Um, I think the technology is there for us to do it safer, to, to create safer, approaches and I think that we could certainly I love the idea of the rotation system where you know I know some of the six form colleges in, in the country have, have taken yeah. that approach in particular and I think that is going to work well I think that that could work very very well because then they're in for a patch of time and I also think in terms of um you know if you if you if you're doing an online lesson in a virtual classroom then attendance is required just the same as if they're not in a, if they're in a physical classroom and I think you know there are many things that we can say okay you, you didn't show up you don't get your mark it, it's we can still we can still monitor attendance we can still do those things in a healthy way that that's going to affirm who they are as individuals it's still important for you to be here it's still important for us to connect with you and again i still think we could make space for the nurturing discussions within that too what do you think in terms of the next sort of 12 months or so i mean none of us have any idea what's going to happen do we but yeah. what do you think would be a kind of mark of, of success for our our children over these coming months where how would you know how could we tell we've done a good job i think when our children and our young people are happy and confident to be in school and they're happy and confident to um to to let their guard down a little and trust you and let you in i think at the minute if we can work on alleviating as many anxieties as possible and if we can create an environment where our students feel safe and they feel welcomed and you know they're nurtured then to me that's success because everything else will follow from that in my opinion that is you know and, I, and it is one of those things you know i'm sitting here you know think oh my goodness i'm just a teacher assistant for crying out loud and it's it, it's it's a big wrestling thing you know it's the whole imposter thing syndrome thing isn't it you know it's a big thing yeah but you know i don't i don't think there's any such thing as just a teaching assistant i i do take issue with that i, I and i, I do yeah i do too and i think you know it, it it's very it, it's really interesting though because i've had i've had some discussions with a few people who who have that view about themselves and i actually wonder um you know a lot of it comes i think from that whole it's go full circle right back to where we started that whole idea of you never quite get there mm. you have to have the piece of paper you have to have the the validation of of the rubber stamp of the, the signature on the certificate and really the the value of of experience is i think it's massive mm. i think it's huge um and that can be quantified i think you can you can quantify i think somebody's experience and their level of experience to do something 
Yeah, I mean, I think certainly one of the things I've been encouraging a lot of uh, colleagues in, in schools to do at the moment while we're trying to work out how do we um, create the environment that we need to for our children and their families, because lots of families really struggling yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, and the thing I feel like a bit of a broken record on it really is just look to your support staff, because actually within almost every um, school or college I've ever worked with, there is a group of staff who know how to do this stuff, who do it every day. And it is, it's your bread and butter, isn't it? And what we, we really need in this moment in in my opinion really is just for everyone to take a, an approach that's a bit more like what you're doing all the time um and that yeah there are really great resources ideas strategies for making this work within every school has that resource we just need to actually stop and talk and and treat as the experts right now those staff who perhaps consider themselves at the bottom of the pecking order um yeah i think they should be leading us through this mm. Is there anything we haven't? I mean, we we, we are oh. very wide ranging. Can't you? <laughs> we could talk for hours, yeah. Hours. Let's, let's, let's just, we could talk for hours. I could talk for hours about this stuff. Honestly, it, it, it really is my soapbox. But no, that I think I think for me, I think what I would like to see is um, a real value of every form of intelligence. I would like to see that. I looked it up actually. What does intelligence mean? And according to the Oxford English Dictionary, it's the ability to acquire and apply knowledge and skills. And it's as simple as that. Um, it's not academic, it's not physical, it's all of those things. There's sport and intelligence, there's artistic intelligence, there's theatrical intelligence, there's emotional intelligence. You name it, it's across the board. And I, I would really like to see, I think if we, be, if we begin in school, I think that will disseminate throughout our society. Personally. Yeah, and I think it's about the value, isn't it, that, that's placed on those those different things? Because as you said right at the beginning, really, that often um, it's academic intelligence that rightly or wrongly is, is always championed as the most important thing, when actually, as you say, there's so many different uh, different kind of parts to it. And mm. it's something that's been a really hot topic of conversation in my uh, household recently, actually, is my daughter Lyra is just in the background uh, while we're, we're recording this. And uh, Lyra um, has just applied for an art scholarship at her school. She decided not to go for an academic scholarship, although she'd been very capable of doing that. Um, but she's taken up art during lockdown mm. and been really brilliantly supported virtually um, by my friend Terry um, and put together a really, really lovely portfolio. And for us as a, as a family and, um, you know, thinking with Lyra about this, it was so important, I think, because my husband and I are both very academic, but what that meant for us when we were at school was actually that some of those other things didn't happen. We weren't developed as sports people or, um, artists or, you know, we didn't, didn't try like a range of different things because we were clever. Um, and yeah, those other things weren't necessarily valued in, in the same way. Maybe it were by our school, but but we didn't perceive that. And so actually for us having a daughter who went, art really matters to me. Um, and I want to try for this, um, yeah, regardless of whether she gets it or not. I love that her school has that as a potential route and that, yeah, she wanted to try. I love that. Um, that makes me very happy. <laughs> <laughs> I love that. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and actually, you know, and I, and I think that's, you know, one, one of the interesting things about the, the whole sort of pandemic, isn't it, is that it's really easy to kind of, and particularly as we enter another lockdown and it's winter now and everything feels kind of bleak, um, it, that can be quite hard. But there are some really brilliant things that have come out of it. And certainly within our family, it has been, you know, Lyra's discovered this amazing love of art and my children have spent more time together. So the two girls have, have got a lot closer. And, you know, there are positives, aren't there? I think Absolutely. there will be really good things that we can... Yeah. Loads of positives, loads right. of positives. Yeah. yeah. Um, what what thought would you like to close with? I know you you thought about this ahead. You did your homework. Which I, I do. Love. I have. I do. I have a part in thought. It's actually it's a favourite quote of mine, and it just I've got no idea who said it. There there is nobody um, accredited with this saying. However, it it is. I'm going to read it because otherwise I get it wrong. Um, it's impossible, said pride. It's risky, said experience. It's pointless, said reason. Give it a try, whispered the heart. And that, for me, is if we can give it a go. If we can give it a go. Let's, let's not say it can't be done. Let's try. Let's just try. Make a difference.